Good morning, Chris Hall, Wake Forest Baptist Health Infectious Diseases. Uh, 15th of April, tax day, although not really. Uh, <laughs> I guess our taxes got put off to May, um, which is a good thing for some of us. Um, so uh, it is uh, definitely spring. Uh, everything's covered in pollen, which means that it is allergy season, uh, just to uh, reinforce the difference between symptoms of allergies and symptoms of COVID. COVID more likely to have fever and a persistent cough. Allergies more likely to not have fever and the cough tends to be more uh, sporadic and sometimes associated with bronchospasm, particularly if you have asthma and use an inhaler. Uh, COVID uh, tends to uh, cause fevers uh, with the headache and body aches where allergies uh, do not usually associated with body aches or headaches unless you have some sinus issues with it. Um, COVID is associated with a loss, very profound loss of sense of taste and smell, whereas allergies are not. If your nose is really stuffed up and plugged up, smell might be a bit of a problem but in between the times um, when it's not so bad, uh, it's still okay. So uh, just, uh, just to reinforce that, I know we've been living with this for over a year now, um, so, um, but in case you forgot. Um, so our cases uh, are nationally um, are, um, are still going up a little bit, probably somewhere between five to 10%. The hard hit places are clearly Michigan, central Indiana, very northern Texas, um, and then um, parts of uh, Indiana and parts of uh, New Jersey and New York, although New Jersey and New York seems to be tailing off some uh, more recently. But by uh, amongst all of those, um, Michigan, and if I didn't mention central Minnesota, um, in fact, Michigan's case rates in a lot of the counties, particularly towards the north and towards the east, uh, are up between 100 and 110 per 100,000. So that's about the level that North Dakota was hit uh, four or five months ago, if you remember, in December and November when they were hit, hit so hard. Um, and uh, deaths are going up with it in those areas, and hospitalizations are going up with it in those areas. Um, there clearly is a shift, though, um, in, that, uh, in that it's younger people getting it now. And we're going to talk a little bit about that more in a minute, uh, but particularly in the 18 to 30-year-old group. And in central Minnesota, <clears throat> um, it, it's in school kids um, to some extent, uh, particularly uh, those who are associated with athletics. Um, and particularly the kind of athletics that are played indoors and or uh, tournaments. Uh, so for instance, a volleyball tournament, indoor soccer tournament, um, and uh, wrestling is another one. Kind of makes sense that wrestling might be risky for COVID. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute uh, in reference to uh, what we should be talking about with our, uh, with our kids. Um, here locally, um, we are uh, <clears throat> going up a little bit. Here in Forsyth County, probably about 5% over the last two weeks. Um, our case rate, if you want to compare it to Michigan, Michigan was about 100 to 110 per 100,000. Here in Forsyth County, as of yesterday, we were 19. So um, it certainly could be a lot worse. But uh, that number is up from 12 uh, two weeks ago. And, um, and here, locally, it's the same kind of epidemiology. It's more younger people. What do I think is driving this increase? Um, nationally, uh, it's a, a combination of relaxation of uh, mitigation merit measures, including masking and distancing, in combination with uh, some variants, particularly in Michigan. The variants are probably um, helping their numbers there. Um, here locally, it's more um, relaxation of measures. So if you remember about three weeks ago or so, um, we increased the uh, capacity for indoor dining and restaurants um, and the number of people who could get together. 
uh, in certain venues, and um, and this is, I think, what's mostly responsible for it here in the triad. Um, there's a there's a, a some modeling that I saw yesterday um, that and mathematical modeling is uh, is basically a, a statistician's way of saying my best guess, but um, take it as it is. But their guesses are a little bit more informed sometimes. And this modeling was done um, by uh, epidemiologists here in North Carolina. And they're doing it sp for specific counties that ask for it. Um, and so Forsyth County did. And uh, so this modeling is specific for Forsyth County. And it takes into account um, what, what is going to happen with COVID in the next three months if um, we have uh, a low uptake on vaccination and slow rollout versus a high uptake and a high roll, you know, a fast rollout, and then also combining continuing to wear the masks and distance versus throwing these away. Um, and there's a spectrum between it. And um, so it, it's kind of interesting. It turns out if we have a as you might expect, a, a slow rollout of vaccination and low uptake, and everyone tosses their mask and distancing. Uh, we'll have a peak that's about what it was in January. Um, and so that's something we would like to avoid. If you remember, that was a very bad time. Um, versus if, it, if we gave a high uptake in vaccination and everyone continues to do their mitigation measures, um, we'll get a slow bump, um, kind of a wavelet uh, here in May. The, the one, the thing that, so it's, it's basically going to be up to us uh, to decide what's going to happen in the next three months for us. Um, I think um, that um, people are going to continue to wear their masks for the most part and social distance. I'm, very, I'm optimistic that we can keep it up for a little while. Um, and. Um, and I think our uptake of vaccination here in our area is actually pretty good. Um, over the ages of 65 now, 70% of our population here have been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, both doses. Um, over the ages of 18, we're, uh, we're clicking in around 35% or so. Um, and, um, and so we're, we're doing okay. Um, the, the group that I think we need to vaccinate, um, who, well, the group who we really need to start focusing on talking about vaccination with is our younger people, in addition to people from uh, historically marginalized populations. And we've been talking about the historically marginalized populations and how we need to outreach to them all along. We've been talking about that, but we haven't been talking so much about um, our younger people. And, and there's, some, there's a f several factors that I think are going into why people between the ages of 18 and 30 aren't getting vaccinated. One is sort of that sense of immortality that young people have. Um, it's not going to happen to me, um, kind of. Number two is uh, sort of apathy. Eh. And for those of you who have 18 to 24 year olds, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so it's. Uh, and then, uh, then last is sort of some of the other things that go in with hesitancy, anxiety, um, concern, worry. But, um, but this is the group of people we're going to really have to reach out to. And we're going to talk again about more, come back to the younger people thing in a minute. Um, so vaccination, I think we're doing okay. Mitigation uh, with the masks and things, I'm optimistic we'll still do okay. So I don't think our peak is going to be huge. Um, that we have here in April and May. But one interesting thing the modeling shows that surprised me a little bit, it's gonna be a little wider than what I initially anticipated. So when I was talking a couple weeks ago, I said here, I think we'll see one here in April, but by May it'll start to tail off. Now I'm saying that I think we're starting to see one here in April, but the, but the uptake is, uh, the uptake in numbers of cases is gonna be slower and it's going to take a little bit longer for it to go away. So it probably will be continuing through May. Um, so um, what does that mean? Well, May, May is a busy time. Um, 
late April and May is a very busy time um, for us as a society, particularly for our younger people. So that's three times I've come back now to talking about younger people. Um, so what's going on with younger people in May? One, graduation um, from schools. Uh, two is, is the weather's nice um, and um, kids are, are definitely a lot more social. Otherwise, people are starting to have sleepovers. Uh, scouts are thinking about camping um, and doing things like that. Um, more social events in general. Uh, and then the prom. <laughs> so um, let's talk about prom first. Um, and so prom for, um, prom is designed to be a uh, not be, prom is designed to not be a socially distanced thing, right? So um, this is where people really get together uh, and have dates um, and so on and so forth. Not all of the uh, school systems in our area are having proms. Uh, for instance, Fourth Heist is not, Davidson is, um, and I, I lose track of which ones are and aren't. Um, if you have a prom, there probably is a way to do the actual prom event in a, in a, in a safer way, um, enforcing masking and um, to some extent social distancing as much as you can, um, which means that dancing well apart rather than slow dancing, so on and so forth. Um, but it, 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 the, the activities that actually concern me more are the activities that go on before the prom and after the prom. And uh, before the prom activities, uh, you know, include going out to dinner um, together. Restaurants have about a three times higher risk of COVID transmission uh, than, um, than a non-indoor dining situation. And then after prom, um, groups of friends going out, um, uh, couples going out spending time together in a non-socially distanced way. And, and transmissions are going to occur. I, I, I can guarantee you that with these events. Now, not all the county's systems are having proms, but there are a lot of, uh, of events um, that I've heard about where parents have been getting together um, and, um, and putting together their own prom systems for schools or friends. Some of these are small backyard events those probably aren't much of an issue, um, supervised, but there's, some of them are bigger events, including in um, large venues. Um, so we're talking hundreds of people. Um, technically, that would not be in line with the, uh, the governor's order, which we still currently have for outdoor gatherings of 100 people. So um, I think that uh, all in all, um, a lot, a, that transmissions are going to occur with proms. Um, and um, I, I realize that if I say don't have a prom, people still will. <laughs> and um, um, so um, there's some things you can do to mitigate risk. So this is like a harm reduction thing. Um, and just realizing that it's probably going to happen. So first thing you can do as a parent, one, talk to your kids. Um, yeah, they do listen um, and talk to them about how important it is to stay masked and socially distanced because the person you're going to prom with or that group of friends you're going with are from a different household um, and, uh, and you want to try to stay safe. So talk to your kids about it um, and have a good, a good conversation too is if your child is over the age of 16, get them vaccinated. Pfizer vaccine is uh, right now cleared down to age 16. Um, and so uh, while if the prom is the first week of May or the last week of April, um, you know, you don't have the full time frame to get fully immunized, but one shot three weeks out is better than no shot at all. And you will have about 80% protection. <clears throat> so um, get vaccinated and um, the, we'll talk more about vaccine in a minute but there are a lot of opportunities right now to get vaccinated including with Pfizer's vaccine for our 16 to 18 year old kids. Um, the um, second thing uh, is, um, is ha get tested. So you can get tested um, either the morning of or the day before the prom event 
and then five days afterwards. Um, while that's not 100%, um, it, it, you know, all these things added up help. Um, and so you can also get tested. Uh, send your kid out with a big bottle of hand sanitizer, um, <laughs> and they go, because uh, uh, keeping, uh, keeping the hands clean is important. And then lastly is really reinforce when uh, there's food about uh, or drink about it at a prom, the mask come down. And uh, the mask, you know, take your sip, take the mask up, take your sip, put it down, put the mask back on, rather than just leaving it in the car. Um, so so those, are, those are all things that um, can reduce, uh, reduce the risk to some extent. Um, the other area besides proms is, uh, is high school athletics, and high school athletics are going strong right now. And we're keeping an eye on it here locally, and if our cases start to go up or we start to see clusters occurring in high schools um, that are associated with athletics, I think we're going to start testing our high school athletes. Um, and, um, and so uh, uh, just as a forewarning, um, and so we're keeping an eye on that. Um, and um, so that's a little bit about um, for our younger people. Um, we need to keep an eye on them. When will our 12 to 18 year olds be able to get vaccinated? <clears throat> it looks like the end of May. Um, so that's a good thing. So that means um, unless there's some major issue um, uh, that um, uh, that comes up, um, we'll have all of our high school kids and a fair number of our middle school kids immunized before they start school in the fall. And that is going to be a big difference uh, for our kids. Um, the vaccines that are applying for the EUA at first, I think, was Pfizer's. It's either Pfizer's or Moderna's. It wasn't Johnson & Johnson, but I think it was Pfizer's. So, um, um, so look for that coming out at the end of May. Um, and you can start talking to your kids about getting vaccinated now. Um, and uh, I think uh, obviously it's a good idea. Um, so um, one other thing I wanted to talk about and mention this morning, since we've been at this for more than over a year, we've gotten a lot of data now. And there's a lot of things that we were doing early in the pandemic that seemed to make sense then. Uh, but don't make so much sense now because we've acquired data and know that it's really not a big deal. One is cleaning everything and doing deep cleanings periodically. Um, so it turns out that, that getting COVID from a surface like a table or a door handle or an elevator button probably is only one out of 10,000 cases of COVID are acquired that way. And so it is just not common at all. And actually just washing your hands every now and then, even if you just do it after going to the bathroom, is probably enough to get rid of that risk. So all of this time and money that we're spending on deep cleaning isn't necessary. <laughs> um, and so I think you're gonna see a lot of uh, workplaces, businesses, shops, schools, and such uh, getting away from that because it's a resource that could be used somewhere else. And that includes in your own home. So um, you can go back to the way you keep your kitchen clean or your bathroom clean in pre-COVID times. It's perfectly fine. Everyone likes a clean kitchen, but uh, you don't have to uh, be putting a pound of bleach into it every week um, and some of those other things are doing. You don't need to be disinfecting your groceries um, or, um, or doing things like that. So a little bit of a release from something that's been kind of onerous for us. Another thing that we found out really doesn't work is screening. Um, and screening is, uh, the, you know, all those questions that you're asked. Uh, like when your kid goes to school, all those questions that you're asked or the app you have to fill out, yes, I feel fine. Um, getting your temperature taken going in the door. Um, and uh, the, it turns out that that's, that doesn't work. And one of the main reasons is like 40% of COVID is asymptomatic. So how's a person going to know? You know, they're asymptomatic. They want to have a fever. They, they're not going to feel sick. So you can ask them all you want. And it's not going to discover it. 
Um, and it turns out in the summertime, the temperature taking is so inaccurate um, that it doesn't make any sense. So I think you're going to see a lot of places get away from doing the screening, including Winston-Salem, Forsyth County Schools made the announcement. I think our private schools are going to get away from it too. Um, and a lot of uh, places when you, where you go to the doctor, um, particularly in the clinic situation, um, is that we won't be doing screening anymore because it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't make anyone any safer. That doesn't mean that you should go to school or work sick. <laughs> we shouldn't be doing that anyway. But we just won't be doing the screening. It's going to become your own responsibility. Um, so there's a couple of things that I think um, um, as time goes on now we're going to, we found that. Uh, the other thing, by the way, we just found that we, there's even more data that outdoor activities are so much safer than indoors. Man, the weather's nice out now. If you're going to have a get-together, neighborhood, friends, family, take it outside, particularly if you're going to have food. Take it outside. Um, and um, um, it's just, a, it's just a so much safer way of doing things. So that's how we're going to get through this wave um, in, the next, um, in the next few months. So in addition to those thoughtful things um, to get through the next wave, we're going to continue to get vaccinated. So um, <clears throat> I gave the, 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 the details for Forsyth County earlier. Um, in the state, it's about this, pretty much the same. Some counties are a little bit further ahead than others. Forsyth, we're actually further ahead for getting people vaccinated. Um, there are uh, uh, plenty of spots now for vaccine. So for Moderna's vaccine and Pfizer's vaccine, there's appointments open with the County Health Department. There's appointments open, I, I know, within our system. Uh, Wake Forest Baptist Health. I'm sure there are with Novant too, I, 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 although I don't, haven't specifically asked them lately. Uh, the way to get it through Wake Forest Baptist Health is to call 336-70-COVID uh, 336 or access your My Wake Health account and you can make an appointment to get vaccinated. And we're getting a fair amount of Moderna and Pfizer vaccine now um, for vaccine um, clinics um, and, uh, and the supply seems to be getting better. So um, what's going on with Johnson & Johnson's vaccine? Um, obviously been in the news. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So what is the concern um, that is that there may be an association uh, with Johnson & Johnson's vaccine with certain types of rare blood clots uh, that can occur? Um, Putatively, that association would occur between um, uh, six and 14 days after getting the shot. After that time, it's, it's not an issue or not even thought to be a problem at all. Um, and, uh, and it's been mostly, uh, the cases that are being looked at are mostly in women. So this is now, um, I think there's up to seven cases in roughly seven million people. So even I can do that math, that's one in a million. So this is basically about the same odds that you have of winning Powerball if you buy a Powerball ticket. It's not good, by the way, so don't run out and buy a Powerball ticket. Um, the, the thing is, is that um, we have to understand a little bit about what this blood clotting thing is. And, how, and about blood clotting in general in humans. Um, and this gets really technical and it's really complicated. So um, in, in, we, we need to clot our blood when we're starting to bleed. And we need to not have our blood clot when we're not bleeding. So the body has this huge, huge complex system of keeping our blood thin and moving when, when, when we don't need to, to stop bleeding. And, it, and that same system causes a clot to happen when you are going to bleed. Every now and then, this complex system in our body uh, gets a little confused and, um, and takes a misstep, and a clot can happen when it's not supposed to. So this happens. Um, 
for a lot of different reasons. There's some medicines that are associated with making clots happen. Some people have certain genetic predispositions to having clots happen when they're not supposed to happen. Pregnancy increases your odds of having clots happen when they're not supposed to. Um, and being on a long plane ride has a, has a propensity to cause clots when they're not supposed to. So, so on and so forth. The list of things that can, cause, that can increase your risk of having a clot when it's not supposed to is about that long, with a small font, by the way. And so, um, yeah, this happens to people from time to time, uh, despite everything that we do to try to prevent it. So a lot of people are on blood thinners because they have a heart condition or other condition that predisposes them to clots. Um, so um, what are the actual risks of having a blood clot? Well, if you're pregnant in a normal, uncomplicated pregnancy, your risk of having a blood clot is about 1 in 150,000. Um, from taking certain medicines, uh, it's about 1 in 200,000, 1 in 150,000, depending on the med. If you have a genetic predisposition, it's 1 in 20,000. If you have nothing at all, your risk is still about 1 in 400,000. So um, the, the, the putative risk that's being investigated now with Johnson & Johnson's vaccine is one in a million. So trying to sort out something that would happen one in a million times and showing causality when the background is already five to six per million during that same, you know, for, the, for somebody who's not received anything or the vaccine. Trying to, to show that causality is really hard. Um, the thing about the Johnson & Johnson um, is that um, the vaccine is somewhat similar to the AstraZeneca vaccine, which does look like there may be an association with blood clotting because of a certain antibody that comes up. Uh, as part of the immune response from vaccination. And that certain antibody can bind to something called a platelet, activate the platelet, and that might cause a clot. So we've had a lot of scrutiny on Johnson & Johnson's vaccine looking for these things. And it may be that what we're seeing, maybe what we're seeing is just the usual background of clotting happening in, in a population rather than an association with the vaccine. So that's why I'm being very careful to say there may be an association, and it, it's, it's, it's really unclear. Even if there is, a risk of one in a million um, is likely a risk that, from a public health standpoint, we would accept, but have a risk-benefit discussion with the person who's getting the vaccine, which is what we do in medicine. Okay, we would like to do surgery. Um, I don't know, pick, pick an operation. We're going to do uh, a life-saving cancer operation for you. The, the benefit of that is, is that you, you have a very good chance of having a remission from your cancer for five years. The risk is, is that you could die on the operating room table. So the you, as the patient, have to weigh that. And, and so for a cancer operation, most people would say, I think I'd rather not have the cancer. I'll, take, I'll accept that little risk of dying on the table. But you know, if you're doing a, uh, you know, a cosmetic procedure or something like that, you might say, well, you know, I'm kind of happy with the way my face looks. Um, and so I'm not going to do that. So, um, so we have these risk-benefit discussions all the time, um, and, um, and I think that's what's going to end up happening after the Johnson & Johnson pause. It may be, for young women, the risk discussion will be a little bit different than it would be for an older guy. Um, we'll have to see, but uh, there are so many benefits to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for us as a society and for us as individuals. One is that it's one shot. 
Two is that uh, there's less adverse effects with soreness and such. Um, and it doesn't have to be refrigerated, so it's a lot easier to get out for rural areas. It's a lot easier for doing students, um, for doing people who have complex schedules, um, so on and so forth. So we'll have to see how all of this shakes out. Uh, but I, I really would like people to put a one in a million risk if that really turns out to be the case in, in perspective um, because um, that's what you need to do when you're talking about risk. So, um, I th oh, a few more things about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because these are questions we've been getting, uh, FAQ kind of questions. So. If you are, uh, if you've gotten Johnson and Johnson vaccine uh, in the uh, in the past, um, should I be looking out for something? Um, you know, um, if you if you're going to have signs and symptoms of a blood clot, they're not subtle. Um, the the ones that happen in the brain cause severe severe headaches, stroke-like symptoms. The ones that uh, would occur in the legs and such cause swelling. Whether or not you've had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it doesn't matter if you've had it or not. If you have stroke-like symptoms with the worst headache of your life, or you have all of a sudden a big swelling in your leg, or horrible abdominal pain, you're going to go to the doctor anyway. So these are the things that need to take you to the ER, whether or not you've had Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So it turns out that if there is an association with clotting with a vaccine, it's going to be within 14 days anyway. So if you've had it in the past, then there's one thing that you could consider yourself immune to COVID, and that's a good thing. Um, so um, the other thing is, is I'm, I've been asked is that uh, um, should I stop my birth control pills? I got Johnson & Johnson vaccine, should I stop my birth control pills? Uh, no, uh, don't stop your birth control pills. That results in a different condition. <laughs> um, and so uh, there's no reason to think that birth control pills plus the Johnson & Johnson vaccine increases your risk more than just the birth control pill by itself. So uh, don't stop your birth control pills. Um, and. Um, I was been asked, uh, does this mean we're not going to have enough vaccine for everybody? Um, no, I mean, we're going to have enough vaccine to immunize our population with or without Johnson & Johnson's vaccine. So um, it, it might be more of a concern for other countries in the world where they need a vaccine that doesn't have the strict refrigeration and freezer requirements. Uh, and where one shot makes such a huge difference to getting a bit rural, undeveloped populations. So for them, it might mean more. But here in the U.S., it's not going to make any difference. So with that, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions, if there are any. Sounds good. See you next week. <laughs>